Good morning. Um, I'm Zainab. Um, uh, thanks for coming this early in the morning. It's quite early. Um, thanks to Hoor, Nawal, Reem, Betul, everyone at SAF that, made, uh, that invited us and made this uh, panel possible. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about the panel is called This Is Not a Program, and it's a panel that is about um, different organizations. Each of the speakers are going to be presenting their um, res um, own institutions, which are uh, based in Cali, Istanbul, um, Sri Lanka, and Beirut, um, uh, and New York at the same time, all over the world. And I think basically what we're going to be talking about, they each sort of came about because of certain um, urgencies in their respective contexts. And we're going to be looking at what that means and what, what they were responding to and how they decided to take action. And we can. Um, We'll just go one by one, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions uh, after you hear the presentations. So I'd like to start with presenting Abir, who is um, actually an architect and an urbanist, and uh, she's based in Beirut, as I said, and she is um, uh, the uh, presenting uh, uh, Public Works, which is a multidisciplinary research and design studio that engages critically and creatively with a number of urban and public issues. And um, they, they have been uh, involved with a, a series of uh, um, topics in Beirut, and she's going to go over them. So, to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Zainab, for the introduction. Um, when I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of Public Works that started in 2012. And uh, when we started this collective of architects, designers, and urbanists, uh, one of our main, uh, our main aims was to enable particular ways of thinking and looking at the city and the urban process more generally, and to tackle uh, urban inequalities departing from our own professional practices. Um, and how our own professional practice could be merged with our active engagement in the public realm, whether as individuals or as a collective. Um, our work departs from a recognition that design interventions constitute three social spaces. The first being the disciplinary space of the studio or the office where we make drawings, plans, and designs. The second being the site of the intervention itself the city, the neighborhood, or the street. Uh, and the third being the space of the self, um, namely the designer's position and positionality and the role he, he or she plays in either creating spaces of differentiation or inclusion. As such, we understand our work as being actively produced across these three social spaces. And we also acknowledge the political dimension of our professional practice. Uh, I'm going to start with a very short video that uh, will be the basis of one of the projects that I'll be introducing, and if we have time, I'll go through another project as well. I'm a ما بقى فيي اخذ لا قرض ولا بقى فيي دبر حلو شو بده يعمل لي هالتعويض ما بيعمل لي شيء البيت اللي قاعد فيه عمره 60 سنه ما في لا شوفاج ما في لا باركينج ولا شيء قد ايه بيصير اجاري حسب اجار جديد 1200 دولار بالشهر تصوروا انه 1200 دولار بيت بهالمواصفات انا اساسا ثانوي اشتغلت كل عمري بكل ثلثين معاشي انه شو بده يكون واحد شو مطلوب يكون حتى يقدر يقعد بهال بالشقه اللي هو فيها بهالشروط اللي طرحها اجار انه الاجار القديم كبونا يعني كبونا هلا جايين كبونا ارجعوا عضياكم بركي انا صرها وضيعتي انا ارجع اقطع كل على ايتي هون روح ليش هو البيت اني دجاج يعني Um, so, this video is part of a bigger project that looks at 
uh, that tackles the issue of housing in Beirut. It traces the story of one uh, lady who's lived in a neighborhood all of her life and who's being forced uh, to evict due to a new rent law that came out in Lebanon. Um, so we started this project with a, with a question that tackles how could we as urbanists and planners uh, tackle one of the most urgent uh, urban issues happening in Beirut today which is the emergence of a new rent law that uh, consequently evicts, evicts all, all old tenants out of their homes and, and, and neighborhoods. Um, we, to tackle this question we looked at uh, the emergence of the law and the fact that the law was issued without, any, without being based on any data, but actually was merely a political tool for the private real estate interests of a very specific class of politicians and uh, developers and investors in Lebanon. What we did is we tackled, we started working on a research project that looks at six neighborhoods in Beirut and conducting workshops with uh, youth in the neighborhood, with residents, with students, to actually produce data that, is, um, that emerges out of the neighborhood and that gives actual numbers and statistics about what it means to live in Beirut, what it means to be a tenant in Beirut. Uh, these are posters for the six neighborhood workshops that we conducted. And the findings that were coming out were uh, multi-layered. One of them was actually producing statistics that the state itself was not producing, which is that of the number of old tenants, how do people access housing, and what are the challenges being faced. These are some of the, the numbers that we produced. On another level, we also mapped abandoned buildings, and in some neighborhoods we were seeing that 20% of the fabric in Beirut is actually abandoned, which is a percentage that's way higher than any other city in the world where the average is usually three to five percent of empty apartments. Um, an important part of the investigation was also looking at transfer and land ownership so that we can also say that um, the future of the city is being drawn and traced by real estate companies that are using uh, incentives given by the state to actually buy off uh, properties in the city. So if you look at this map, this is the transfer of property from old ownership to real estate developers uh, in the past 10 years in one of Beirut's neighborhoods, uh, the, the yellow ones. Based on this research, we were also, we were also tracing stories and nar narratives of eviction. A large number of Beirut's residents were being evicted consistently. Um, these eviction narratives were to us very important to map and to document, not merely as a research tool, but also as a way, as a political tool of trying to say that this is a citywide condition and not a particular case by case condition. From these eviction findings, we started working on an eviction monitor, which is a digital online platform that starts to uh, archive these evictions, uh, narrate eviction stories, but also supports uh, families and individuals, either legally or socially, who are being subject to eviction. Um, all throughout our work, departing from research uh, and from acts such as the eviction monitor, a lot of, most of the projects that start off as being research projects then go into a phase of dissemination where we try to produce knowledge in Arabic relevant to the, to the local context uh, in different forms, so either in articles or in videos, such as the, the one we, uh, I, I showed in the beginning, or through neighborhood meetings where the neighborhood where we conduct the research, we go back to the neighborhood, we present the research, and engage the residents in actually organizing around this re research, organizing around ideas of what we could demand for our neighborhood, and allow for, for these discussions to be the basis for future uh, future policy changes or uh, political demands. Another project uh, that is a bit similar in methodology, um, the first one was more tackling housing rights in Beirut, the second one really tackles public space in Beirut. And how do we look at our right to the city as a, um, as a in a sense that 
everyone has the right to intervene upon his or her, or her city, and we have the right of the complete usage of outdoor uh, and open space. So we started this project entitled um, Play and the City, Communal Making of Informal Football Fields, with a very simple question. Uh, where do children and young people play in Beirut? Our first, uh, our first entry point was that we looked at an aerial photo of the city dated back to 2004. On this aerial photo, we started spotting all empty fields that are made out of sand, so they looked orange in the aerial photo. And then we started, and this project was done in 2014, so 10 years after the aerial photograph. After spotting these, these uh, red fields, we started visiting them. And we came out with the percentage that almost 85% of these plots, which were communal outdoor play spaces, have been replaced either by parking lots, uh, new buildings, or construction sites. When we further investigated the remaining fields that were still open and accessible in the city, we started to realize an entire uh, network of young boys and girls who are actually claiming space in the city and claiming privately owned plots because of the lack of publicly owned open spaces to actually play and be in the outdoors. Their acts of transgression or of claims were through um, going between installing staircases to be able to reach the site, uh, jumping over walls, um, going between uh, gates, tagging what they call their football goal, and sometimes actually gathering money to make their own uh, football nets. We started looking at each one of these uh, 10 football fields, uh, which are all on privately owned plots, and we drew like a narrative timeline about each one of them, investigating the history of their emergence, how neighborhood youth actually organized themselves, collected money, put their own efforts to, to turn these sites into, into their own play spaces. And some of them have been there for 40 years, some of them have been demolished, some of them are newly emerging. And based on these 10 cases that we looked at, so the research phase, we then took one, one of the fields and decided to do a pilot project where we actually work with the neighborhood youth to try to affirm their claims, but also rehabilitate these fields and uh, preserve them from, from being lost. So we started one of the pilot projects in uh, Marlies Palestinian camp in Beirut, and the workshop was called the Lab Fil Mukhayam, play in the camp. Um, we started with the young participants to map their actual social practices and cultural practices in the field, which uh, ranged from actual playing of football to picnics, to all sorts of, uh, of activities that emerged from the community. We also worked with them on them documenting through photography, uh, the young participants, their play spaces. So you had all these diversity of photographs where they're producing actual representations of their play spaces. Uh, we also did these exercises of who does what and where. And this is where we start to see a huge um, gender difference. Um, and we wanted to really work on how could young girls also be present in the public, public realm uh, through the way that they want to be present. Um, we also workshopped with them ways of them imagining the future of their field. How do they want it to be? What is their ideal day in the field? So they produce a, through different techniques, different collages of what they want to do in the field. And the final phase, which is something we're working on now, is to actually work with the bigger community on creating um, like a governing body or a community out of the residents that's able to uh, govern the field, that's able to ameliorate it, that's able to uh, think of the future of it. So organizing is one of the most important outcomes of the work that we do. So these interventions, whether they're in the form of neighborhood meetings like we did in the housing project, or uh, creating local community representatives that are able to uh, manage very specific ways of everyday life in the camp 
are one of the most important outcomes of organizing that's very much related to um, the way we think about research, design, and the city. I'm going to stop here, and we can continue the discussion. That's great, thank you, Abir. Just a very logistical question before we go on. How long does it take usually to um, sort of start and come to fruition with one of these projects, and how many of them are you juggling at the same time, just to sort of? Um, the housing project, for example, the, the research phase where we did the six workshops in six neighborhoods was a one-year uh, research project. But that was from 2015 to 2016. From 2016 until today, we're thinking about creative ways of dissemination, but also of developing a language, a, langu a visual language to actually uh, um, put in the public realm these outcomes and not make them seem as if they're a product of public works. We, we very rarely put our logo on the videos that we make. We always try to frame them within uh, within bigger campaigns that try to create networks of people. So we're really trying to merge, uh, as I said, our professional practice with our engagement in, in the public. And this takes a lot of time and sometimes we have very little resources, but... Yeah. Such is life. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, we'll come back to um, you, of course, um, but uh, we'll go to raking leaves now. Um, and um, uh, uh, Charmini is Charmini Pereira is an independent international curator. She is the founder and director of Raking Leaves in the Sri Lanka Archive of Contemporary Art, Architecture, and Design, and she will be speaking about um, her practices related to raking leaves today. So. Thank you very much, Zainab. Um, hello, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't got very much of a voice, um, so I'm going to try and shout at you, but <laughs> don't take that the wrong way. Um, so when I set up Raking Leaves, um, it was back in 2008, um, and it's very difficult to post-rationalize why you do something. Sometimes it's very intuitive. So. In terms of thinking about the challenges um, in, in the context of this panel, um, I think the first thing that I had in mind was a location, and that was Sri Lanka. And I wanted to um, just, I wanted to find a way of presenting contemporary art um, that did not require a gallery or a museum space. And, those such spaces existed in the country. Um, I'm showing you here an image of the National Art Gallery in Colombo. <coughs> this is where displays would stay pretty much, as I'm showing you here, for 20, 28, 30 years without changing. They were dead spaces, essentially. When I first saw the painting at the very end of this gallery, I was 23, and that was some time back. Um, there were also other uses for the art gallery, namely state funerals. If I just read you a little line here, um, the one that's ringed, it says, at this moment his corpse lies in the art gallery for public salutation. And where collections did not exist, the gallery was rather, um, instead of being a curated space, it was a rented space. I'm showing you here, Barefoot Gallery, um, which is in the center of Colombo. And often these galleries, these commercial galleries, which would be rented, were in very beautiful surroundings. Um, and often the artwork became, was secondary, as you see here. Artwork is hanging outside with no real thought, perhaps, to the fact that it might require some kind of temperature-controlled environment. And as so often as we get in Sri Lanka, art is seen in the context of cafes here behind cake which, you know, we all love cake, but um, so rather than set up <coughs> a art gallery or a gallery space, um, I turned to publishing. 
because it offered, um, in my view, a very different approach to distributing um, ideas, if you like, and practices about contemporary art um, in Sri Lanka. Um, and it was also a way of bringing art to people who were not accustomed to visiting these more elite spaces, if you like, in the capital. More than anything, I wanted to find a way or a form or a modus operandi that would be transportable so that, in effect, somebody who was living in London, somebody living in New York, in Sharjah for that matter, could become acquainted with an artwork, a practice from Sri Lanka or South Asia, given the fact that at, that t at the time when I set up Breaking Leaves in 2005, there were very few opportunities to see work from the region. And publishing was a way of, of reaching an audience, in this case a public or publics, to publish, as most of us know, literally means to make known, whether that's in digital form or in printed form. <coughs> but the word publish is a modification of the French Anglo word uh, publier, which is derived from the Latin publicus, which means it has its root in the word um, public. So this linguistic relationship between books and public was something that I had very much in my mind when I decided to embark <coughs> on working with printed matter as a curator. The cultural theorist Benedict Anderson, who many of us probably know, coined the term imagined communities. And in doing so, he was trying to think about um, the role of print culture in creating what he called communities of strangers. He thought about how reading a book would connect us through this experience Though we might not have met, we might not know one another, we would be connected by a certain political persuasion in his mind, a sort of collective consciousness. And this sense of shared values was what he saw in printed matter, being read by people in different parts of the world. The allegiance of people's taste to certain newspapers was the example that he wrote, wrote much about. I'm showing you here a picture of people who are reading about the D-Day invasion. Similarly, this is an image of the Jaffna public newspaper room in Sri Lanka in the north. So when I turned to publishing, I turned to a very particular kind of publishing. It wasn't newspapers, though. It wasn't leaflets. It wasn't monographs, nor exhibition uh, catalogues, or even theoretical books. Instead, I turned to artist books. Stephen Berry, who is um, a well-known writer on the subject, has written a definition that is quite useful. He says, quote, artist books are book or book-like objects over which the final appearance an artist has had a high de degree of control, where the book is intended as a work of art in itself, end quote. And when I set up Breaking Leaves, I had very much an idea of an artist's book in my head, in that art books, or art projects, rather, would be about making um, or commissioning an artist to make an artwork that had an inevitability about it in the form of a book. So Raking Leaves commissions artists to make artworks in the form of the book. And at the back of my mind, I was also thinking about the 1960s and 70s, when artists' books began to proliferate in the prevailing climate of social activism and political, sorry, social and political activism that accompanied many anti-war uh, demonstrations that mainly took place in Europe and the US. And it was in turn the same time that many artists began to question the authority of the art world, leveling their criticism mainly at museums and cultural institutions for being too white, too male, too prescriptive, too elitist. There are many examples, as many of us know, about works from this period, and Fluxus in particular embodies much of this critical spirit, especially a work like this, where artists were find, trying to find ways to create art, artworks that circumvented the gallery and the art market. 
It was at this time, too, that a number of artist-controlled alternative spaces began to be set up, such as Printed Matter, which became an alternative space, a bookshop, essentially, and a distributor of this new form of artist books. But as Lucy Lippard says, and it's a sort of cautionary reminder, Lucy Lippard was involved in setting up Printed Matter, quote, inexpensive in price, modest in format, ambitious in scope, the artist book is also a fragile vehicle for a weighty load of hopes and ideas. My hope and ideas for Raking Leaves differed from the idea of the artist books that were produced by Fluxus, or for that matter, sold in shops like Printed Matter. Firstly, all the book projects that Raking Leaves produces are mass produced, using the very standard offset printing process. They're not unique. They're not unique works, that is and they're not made using any kind of specialist printing techniques. And I think most importantly, <coughs> they don't cost anything more than $35 a project. But rather than, in, that rather than resisting the institution or lack of, the book projects that Reiki News produces oppose a number of assumptions about contemporary and modern art practices in Sri Lanka and in the region that I frequently used to run into 15 years or so ago when people used to view art from Sri Lanka, or the region for that matter, as a derivative, unoriginal, amateur, of less historical, art historical value. And Raking Mies, for me, was a way to counter this encumbrance. As many as you probably know, Sri Lanka is just coming out of a very long, protracted civil war. And I'm showing you here the work of Stephen Champion, <clears throat> which depicts the very harsh brutality of the civil war in the country. It's just a prelude, an intro to the first Raking Leaves book. It's called The One Year Drawing Project, May 2005 to October 2007, and was produced against this very backdrop that I'm talking about of the war, of the conflict. Stephen's work continues to give you an idea of the curfews, the paramilitary killings, the mass displacements, the loss of loved ones, and the weekly bombings. Provide some context, if you like, against which the One Year Drawing Project was conceived and curated, but not, as you might first imagine, as a protest against this war, no, but as a critique, in fact, of how the war attracted funding for art projects and how such projects gathered artists together for weekend or two-week workshops, at the end of which they would present work in the spirit of solidarity, discussion, and collaboration. And over time, how these workshop exhibitions started to proliferate, giving rise to hastily made work, replacing what, in my mind, was work that should have been made in studios. And that whole idea of a studio practice, a slow release of work being made over a duration of time, seemed to almost disappear. So the One Year Drawing Project was an attempt to understand the relationship between time, practice, collaboration, and dialogue within the context of conflict. Using drawings and no words, four artists agreed to take part in this experiment that took them back to an exchange, the idea of an exchange. The project began with four artists working, making four drawings, each of them May 2005, that they then exchanged. At the outset of the project, a time frame of 52 exchanges was decided, for corresponding to 52 weeks in a year. And the idea was that you would exchange a drawing once a week. But the project began in May 2005, and the completion of the project took, um, took them until October 2008. It took 18 months to finish. I'm just showing you the first few pages of the book project. The first drawing begun by Mahanad was sent to Thenora, who made this project, who made this um, drawing in response, who sent his drawing to Shnathanan, who made this in response, and so on and so forth. And what we did 
in producing this book project was we printed so that there was an intentional show through on the left hand page so you could compare what was seen on the right hand side with what came before it. I recently showed this project as an installation of books in Dhaka at the Dhaka Art Summit. But it was launched here in the UAE, in fact, in 2008 at Art Dubai 10 years ago. But to get the book into the UAE, we had to go through the censorship channels that uh, require you don't have any uh, nudity. So to do this, actually, at uh, the printers, I ask them to black out all of the areas that carried any nudity. And it was interesting, actually, to see that, you know, this sort of resistance, if you like, to censorship also involves an element of compliance with it, but at least on our own terms. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time here. <laughs> um, the next project is by Aisha Khalid, and I will speed up. Um, it's a copy book where she wanted to um, create uh, one of these books that uh, when you're learning to write and you practice letters, um, I'll just skip this slide here, um, you, you use lined, um, uh, lined exercise books and you practice the letters. So on the left-hand side, she had an Urdu section, and on the right-hand side, an English section. And her recollection is that when she was growing up in Pakistan, that her Urdu exercise books were full of printer's errors, where margins were not straight, pages were upside down, sometimes they didn't even hit the press. And then in the middle of the book, where the English lines, this is the Urdu section, and where they meet in the middle, is where you have this misregistration um, of one culture, if you like, um, sort of superimposing itself over another. And for Aisha, who grew up as an Urdu speaker, having to learn English was really the language um, that would give her more social mobility, but actually it was a language that she wished to resist if she was to hold on to her mother tongue and her, uh, her Urdu identity. And the interesting thing about this entire project was that every single page in the book was um, a painting, and it was a reproduction. The whole book is made up of a reproduction of 243 vastly um, paintings, so I'm showing you two of them here. On the left is the English paintings she did, and on the right are the Urdu paintings. And you can see in the book, as you see on the top there, the little bit of blue that uh, smudged um, each and every page is absolutely unique. Then you find this in the Urdu section of the book, which everybody probably has come across at some point in their life. It's the dog ear, which is actually just what happens when the... Uh, it's, very, it's bad printing, in fact, when you... Uh, you just um, see it, um, and in fact, everything I've just told you is, is, is in there, written where the dog ear section is. The last project, in fact, is a nice one to finish with. It's um, uh, an artist from Pakistan, Barney Abdi, and Barney made a book project back in 2003, which was the starting point for the conversation for her Raking Leaves book project. These small flick books are where cinema began. Bunny is trained in film. This is Imran Qureshi. He can't quite say I love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so her project for Raking Leaves was to revisit the flick book. Um, as I say, it's where film began in book form. And the, the book project that she did um, looked at the life of a speechwriter. The book is called The Speechwriter. And the front of the book is a, a little transcript of somebody who has come to interview a man, an elderly gentleman, who is um, involved, he's a retired speechwriter, and he's invo involved in a daily activity which sees him sitting every day in front of a microphone speaking to it. Um, and 
really why I think it's perhaps an interesting one to end on is because, um, of course, it's silent cinema, there is no sound, but also sometimes the, maybe the best form of resistance is, is often um, an action of silence, which perhaps is, is what is captured here. So if I just play you the book, um, you, will, you will see what I, what I mean. So this is the chair that he sits in. Um, when you open the, um, the book, there are 10 flick books and they're numbered across them, um, one, two, three to 10, and you would ideally read them in order. So when you come to this book, you are aware that he's speaking into a microphone inside his house, which is wired up to loudspeakers on the outside of his house, this sort of idea of speaking out to a public, to a community. Thank you, Sharmini. It's great to hear. Um, it's also like the wide range of distribution. I mean, just I think this is something we can touch upon later on. But um, I mean, you're coming from an architectural background. You're coming. The project is very much about um, with raking leaves publication, and we talked earlier about a little bit of um, the wide range of. Um, uh, distribution that you have, um, just sort of like, these are very logistical questions, but to understand how it reaches, how many places do you distribute it, and how do you send it, and what's sort of your arrangement there? Uh, Reiki Neves has uh, distributors, so um, fortunately that work is done for, for us. Um, the distributors would work with museum bookshops or bookshops, uh, independent bookshops. So we have five distributors. Um, for South Asia, I, um, I do the distribution. Is the distribution networks don't really come into the region that much. Um, but yeah, fortunately, uh, that works for us. And, and one of the projects just from two weeks ago is sold out. Um, and the print runs, we do our 3,000 copies. So yeah. Great. Thank you. That's great to hear. Um, we're going to go into uh, to Alper, Alper Turan, um, and that's a, a curatorial collective. Talk about the different ranges. We do have a lot of um, uh, different uh, technique um, strategies for how to distribute art or to work with artists. And um, Alper Turan is the co-founder and curator of Das Art Project a curatorial collective that aims to work outside white cube gallery spaces. He uses thematically specific buildings, often with historical significance, to realize mostly ephemeral exhibitions with younger generation artists. And you're going to talk about that more now. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alper, and I'm from Istanbul, as Zeynep said. I'm here as a representative of the Art Project, um, a curatorial uh, non-profit collective based in Istanbul. What we do is basically um, realizing curatorial projects uh, with artists of our generation, um, mostly, and by using uh, various spaces, uh, historical, iconic, or uh, invisible, uh, inaccessible buildings. 
and we like to use the atmosphere of this building by, uh, by creating shows in these spaces. Um, also, it is important for us to make them accessible for a short term. Um, as does start, we are three, and Chisam and Oljan, uh, my partners are not here now, but we are all co-founders and uh, creators of the project. And we actually met um, while, we, while we are doing our uh, long-term internship in Istanbul Modern, of Museum, uh, Istanbul Modern Museum of Art. And we both were still undergrad students. And we are really honored uh, and happy to say that uh, that's our project is an organization of interns, uh, amateurs, and not conventional uh, art professionals. Um, I was dreaming about doing something in creative industry and I was planning to do master in culture stu um, curatorial studies and I thought it would be cool to have a um, curatorial project in my portfolio and actually that's how it all started and it turns out to be something that we can learn uh, through practicing. Um, so. I'm going to show some images from our projects. Yeah. Our first project was in October 2016 in abandoned uh, derelict building in railroad area of Istanbul. It was a beautiful building made by one of the most famous um, modernist architect, uh, Kemal Etin, the architect, but it was really um, in bad condition. Um, the building was designed to be uh, a guest house, um, and we get a chance to have a permission to use that building, um, but only for one day. And theoretically, it was a cool idea um, to have an exhibition for just one day with 20, um, 26 artists. Um, that's how we could emphasize um, the characteristic of our exhibitions, the ephemera characteristic of exhibitions. Um, and since it was a guest house, uh, we could say that we are the guests staying for a day there. And in practice, we already did not have any budget to keep this uh, exhibition open for long term. And our team was simple enough. We, we choose a world, the Turkish world, Güven, which can be translated as uh, confidence, trust, dependence, but also safety. While we were, while we were thinking about uh, the team, we asked ourselves what we lack of, and the answer was Güven, and the exhibition was opened after coup d'etat in Turkey, um, and this lack was common in social and in the individual level. are some images from oxytocin. Um, in our second exhibition, um, and the building of the second exhibition is total opposite of the first one. If the first one is like uh, sepia and gray, uh, the second one is um, white and gold, actually. Uh, because it was in ballroom of a legendary hotel uh, in Istanbul, Pera Palace, uh, which is in Pera Beo district. Uh, the hotel was one of the first Western hotel in Turkey, and it contributed a lot to Turkish Ottoman Orientalism. And we tried to draw a parallelism between history of the uh, history of the hotel and uh, today's decadency. Uh, by using some references of hotel's history and its uh, legendary visitors like Agatha Christie, uh, Hitchcock, uh, or Hemingway. And as a curatorial collective, we actually make, made an intervention uh, in this exhibition. And we installed a simple work, a light work, in Agatha Christie's room. Um, there were two lights and they were turning on and off in a minute's lapse. 
It was a reference to a pacifist, pacifist uh, public protest after um, scandalous political mystery. And th that mystery was uh, related to Christian meetings. Um, that, that mystery uh, seems so related to Agatha Christie's all uh, mysterious novel and his character. To be honest, this exhibition was, um, this exhibition turned out something that we didn't expect. There were a lot of challenging situations and um, in terms of our practices also, we couldn't see some possibilities. So that's how actually we understand that that's not an easy job to do. Um, Um, Maybe like hotel administ administration was biggest problem, and we understand that okay we we need to be independent, totally independent. Uh, the third one, the third project was actually uh, part of Zeynep's uh, exhibition Bahar, which is um, an offsite exhibition, one of the ex offsite exhibitions of last year's Charge of Biennial, and. The team given to Istanbul was crops, and basically the question of Zeynep was, what do people do uh, while crops are growing? And our response and our uh, aim in this uh, sub-exhibition to label um, our generation as a genetically modified crops. Um, Zeynep had chosen a big mansion in Sultanahmet area and the building was used to be a school, uh, and we located in darkest and most humid part of the building, the Hammam area and water reservoir. Uh, this exhibition is, was interested in uh, what purity means for our generation, and its aim is not to break with childishness and child, childhood, and it was an attempt to create genetically modified monuments. Oops, I forgot. To these were from uh, Decadence, the second exhibition. Um, yeah. These are from uh, Genetically Modified. Um, this is from a video installation um, <coughs> projected onto a reser water reservoir. Uh, it was an eternal loop, and it shows constant rising of uh, pink rockets, as if mm, coming out of soil. Um, I have to say that we also influenced by Emil Zola's Germinal uh, by doing this exhibition, in which the author uh, describes uh, minor worker as a venomous army getting prepared for next century's harvest. Um, yeah. Our fourth project was actually an exep exception in terms of our practices, um, which was solo exhibition of Halil Altındere, who is not at all an uh, emerging artist. And it was the first time we were making a solo exhibition. And it was really exciting for us to work with him. Um, and also, it was uh, important for us to gain experience uh, in working with established artists and his galleries. Um, and also, this time, we, we have to use uh, exhibition designers that we normally don't uh, prefer to use. Uh. I don't want to talk about the works because they're already on view now in Sharjah, uh, in Alt Planetarium, and also in the main exhibition area. But basically, this uh, this exhibition was about a refugee crisis. Uh, oh. And these were the maids, uh, These were uh, the works made in 2016, and were not. Uh, exhibited in Istanbul before. Um, 
yeah, I think that's all I can say. Thanks, Saipa, uh, for that. <laughs> um, we're going to go on to our last speaker, actually. Um, either way, whatever. <laughs> and that's Sally. Uh, I can put the video on, actually, Sally, for Sally. And Sally is, um, uh, Sally Mizrahi Mugrabi, is the co-founder of Lugar Dudas, uh, which she co-founded with the artist Oscar Munoz in 2003. Uh, she serves as the executive director of the Contemporary Arts Center in Cali that develops several lines of work and offers spaces and opportunities to host projects and external discussions. Prior to this, she had her own design atelier. And maybe you can, I'm going to actually ask you to sort of um, reflect on how that came in as a practice to what you're doing uh, later on, but just to keep that in the back of your mind. But, um, so. Okay, thank you, Sine. Uh, thank you to all the team of Sharha Foundations for having me in this great meeting. Salam Alaikum. <laughs> My name is Sally, and let me share the story about Lugar Dudas. My country is Colombia, a very far from here, a paradoxical and complex one. You can find a variety of climates, infinity of natural resources, many ethnic groups, and the second highest biodiversity in the world after Brazil. At the same time, we have living through numerous internal armed conflicts for more than 50 years. To today, a peace deal with one of the re revolutionary group we, but we haven't a peace yet. But this is another story. Cali is the city where I come from. It is a vibrant city located in the southwest region of Colombia, the third largest of the country with two and a half million inhabitants. There are six universities with departments of arts, one museum of art, modern art, arts, and two commercial galleries. These pictures are from Lugar a Dudas, so I let them to run through while I'm telling the story of. Mm, Lugar a Dudas opened in 2005 as an attempt to respond to the needs of Cali art scene in a historical moment when despite the frenetic activity of several groups of artists, there weren't spaces to show their work nor initiative th that support their practices. Institution at that time, more than now, ignored those artists and acted based on populism without a clue of what cultural policies were about. So the project started as a gesture of cultural resistance. The origin is related with problems generated with process of institu institutionalization of art. One could say that the first impulse respond to the inactivity of the cultural institutions of the city at that time. However, the concert is not aimed at filling these gaps, but on the contrary, to build with these institutions an active local scene, establishing net networks, creating partnerships, and achieving greater impact. While the idea of creating a space was initiated by Oscar Munoz, as Zineb said, its implement, implementation is the result of a collective effort. The project has been built with the participation of many artists and people who have contributed from different perspectives and discipline to create possibilities of exchange and dialogue. Beyond the visibility of tangible artistic products, Lugar Adudas places particular emphasis to produce the context for art foster the exchanges of ideas and change institutional structures. Our action is articulated through programs that re respond to specific needs of artists and publics in the city. In the same way, these programs explore and investigate forms of organization, pedagogical models, and emerging practices inviting groups and communities that are excluded from the institutional system to participate. 
Lugar a dudas is a space in which the permanent conversation of the team and collective decision is fundamental. The activities are proposed as different forms of knowledge and learning models freer and unconventional. These models emphasize to create relationship systems that are far from power structures, encouraging more horizontal relationships built in proximity, dialogue, and critical thinking. Beyond the specific events that we organize, we want people experience and use the spaces as a meeting point to discuss, reflect, or just be there. The space includes includes a documentation center, exhibition rooms, a residency program, field projection, projections every week, seminars, and workshops. The documentation center is the undoubtedly the most complete reference space in the city and one of the largest in the country on issues related to current artistic pra practices. It produces the photocopioteca, a set of small, a small publications curated on diverse subjects, exhibits archival materials and curated proposals that can be displayed at their tables. The window shop is the main exhibition space. It, it is a white cube exposed to the street. It is essential because of the daily connection between the citizen and artistic production. The ensayadero, the rehearsal room, is a versatile, versatile platform. Artists, collectives, photographers, publishing initiatives, and others, they obtain for a period of one month to six weeks a space of work and experimentation where they can, where they can develop talks, free curatorial projects, publication, workshops, and others without the commitment that their practices or projects should have a final form. This space is dedicated to exercise the rehearsal and to give value to error. The residency program, which aims to stimulate research and reflection on artistic practices, provide opportunities to work, live, and share experience and concerns with other artists and the local context. One of the major challenges we face as an institution is the implementation of an international school of critical thinking and transdisciplinary processes. A year ago, we started the Uncertain School, which is the realis realization of a desire of Victor Albarracin, our artistic director. In 2016, he proposed the project to the team, and we were happy to accept it. After a year of work, the project took form. In a few months, we began the process. We figured out how to make it possible in the midst of financial fragility. We wrote application for scholarships. We opened a call. We invite people we knew, and we looked for ways to contact those who we didn't, didn't know. Four students came, many from Colombia and others from places like Amsterdam, New York, or Lima. During six weeks, it was a space for critical discussion with a serial, series of conversations. In recent years, Lugar Adudas has hosted initiatives from theater and performance groups, musicians, writers, radio groups, diverse communities, women's groups, publishing projects, informal schools, experimental filmmakers, and a large number of other social agents that have found in the space the open doors for their actions. Some days, groups of people arrive to study or to help discussions. Sometimes there are experimental theater groups taking the whole house as a set. Frequently, we host an Afro women collective that meet to share personal stories, discussing the pains and the glory of their curly hair as a way to nourish their sorority. Other days, there are punk or new wave bands rehearsing at the patio. Many times, everything happens at the same time, inviting different, people, people, different groups of people to interact. We don't want to take control what can take place. The challenge of Lugaradudas is to show the value of artistic practices and their relevance 
and relationship with society in order to recognize the artist as powerful actor that manifests ideas, realities, and the problems of a society. We will assume and propose new ways, new, new ways of doing and learning, always bearing in mind that our own ecosystem is a fragile and modest, although at the same time rich. To, talk, to take risks and be able to make changes when required. To be sensitive to the, to the changes. It is always changing and in permanent activation. Starting from experience from what there is. We are permanently looking for new ways to act, to activate, to generate mobility from, uh, from and to the edges in order to expand our ties and our affections maintaining rigor in risk, the freedom to rethink, to explore and redefine models that relate the new needs and possibilities. After 13 years, we can say the artistic scene changed, and the needs that led to Lugar a Dudas 13 years ago are not the same today. There are several aspects that we can name and they allow and that allow us to perceive those changes that have occurred in, a lo in the local artist scene in this decade. We are gone from being a city that had a few weak institutions and a museum of modern art that was not very active, barely interacting with the local scene and with few artists, to a number of institutions as well as a museum that began to propose dialogues providing tools for the debate and a program that benefits not only the artistic scene, but also extends the relationship with the public and the city. We went from small artistic initiatives that emerged and disappeared very quickly to a series of new initiatives, some with physical space, others nomadic or without space, that are being born today in some manner permeated by Lugar a Dudas, with more impetus and more consistent ideas. Thus, together, we make up part of the local scene in an active and critical way. We went from total lack of support and encouragement in the visual arts in Cali to establish an alliance with the municipality to be advisors of a portfolio of stimuli to support the production of local artists. Lugar a dudas, if you don't know, in, it means place for doubts, alludes, alludes to a space of thought. We believe the actions and gestures have more power, the power of resignifications, which will nourish our proposals in their encounters with others. We try to create conditions to break paradigms, expanding our ethical principles of openness, generosity, hospitality, affection, care, and time, always thinking of an open space. Beyond being an art center, we want to begin to understand ourselves as a center of thought that uses art as a vehicle. In wor words of uh, our artistic director, Victor Albarracin, he said, a place that can assume different forms because thought is the most malleable of materials, the richest, richest in form and the most capable of giving varied results. In this historical moment of cognitive capitalism, the brain is a factory, and we are calling on those workers of information to revolt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's interesting because when we were talking uh, on the phone, you said something, and actually it comes back to me like you said that um, something along the lines that we do experiments and whatever we works, we take it bigger, like not bigger in the sense of make it sh more showy, but whatever we works, we just sort of continue off of that and turn it into something else, such as the rehearsal uh, um, practices, yeah. I guess, or how you turn into even like um, having an artistic director, you coming from a different background and being the executive director and then deciding to 
actually have an artistic director. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about this? Mm, the space uh, changed uh, responding to the needs of the context. So at the beginning, we started with two spaces for exhibition. I don't know if you see, so the, the vitrine and one space inside of the house. Then, because the, the context and the local scene changes, in 10 years it changes, so we decided that we don't need more mm, exhibition space because there are many collectives of artists that started to exhibit their, their projects. So we, we decide that we, we want to change the, the exhibition space inside to a rehearsal space to, to, to show the exhibition in another way, to show an experimental, how the, the projects that ha, had no the opportunity to be shown to, be, to, to have the space for, for this. So there are mm, a space, as it says, the rehearsal, they can experiment, they can, mm, they have no, the obligation to have a final product. They, ha they, they have the space to, to experiment, to, to do, and to show uh, the process of all the project. So they take the, the 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 space for six weeks. Every every Friday they show what they are developing to the public, and that's it. And you said um, ah the artistic director. At the beginning, the for the for many for many years, like ten years. We started with our vision, our friends, our the, our people that we know. So we invite for talkings and for develop the activities. And then we said, okay, we need to quit and to reflect. And we started to think that uh, it's mm, good to let others to take the space. So we uh, make a call to young curators to propose a pro an international call to propose a project to develop during six months, but they are going to come in for three months because the budget. <laughs> and for three years, we did that. But then we, it was a very good experience. It was uh, an experimental, <laughs> A, um, idea, but then we decide that we prefer um, to have someone developing the ideas with the team because we like those um, dynamic to take decisions together and someone that could stay in Cali, that could develop and could uh, know better the context because before the, the, um, the curators that came, they developed the project, but we also have some other activities. So it was a very low, um, act many activities and the project of the curator. So we decided to have the, the artistic director to work with the team and to know better the, the local context and propose the activities together. Interesting. I, I actually like maybe um, Abir. I'm gonna extend from that question to you because when we were talking, you did say also that you uh, started off with two people. You're the uh, co-founders, and then afterwards, slowly, like you had to shrink and um, and uh, enlarge the team uh, according to the uh, projects. And I was just thinking. I mean, in a different way. Um, uh, the projects are, of course, founded in different time frames, but you were founded in 2008, uh, as far as I know. I was just wondering if you think that the specific time, because, I mean, of course, you interact with the city. You're um, starting off from an urbanist background and an architectural background, but 
was the time that you were founded very much uh, uh, a response to what's going on in Beirut and how you started to think of projects and to come up with the projects? Because you're the ones, sometimes commissions come to you, but you're usually the ones who come up with the concept and sort of start going out into the world and trying to get people organized and get a team going. So. Um, and also how it developed over the years as a response to what's been going on in Beirut since 2008, right? I'm pronouncing it right, over the last 10 years, like uh, what's been happening. Um, the, one of the main motivations in how we began work is that I think we're at generation that graduated from the university with a very big passion for research and knowledge production, but also with the frustration that knowledge production is confined in academic institutions that publish purely in, Arab, uh, in English and that's targeted to, a, to an outside audience. So, and that was the same time of the 2006 Israeli war on Lebanon. Um, so time of graduation coincided with, with that phase. And um, Nanin and I, who co-founded, who founded the Public Works back then, uh, intuitively got engaged in the 2000, uh, the post-war reconstruction efforts across all of Lebanon. And we, were, we did that on a, on a vol volunteer basis, but that also opened a lot of questions for us. So if knowledge production is so important because it's, a, it's the main basis where we can produce, uh, we can actually get engaged in informed activism. So it's not, and activism ever since, for the past 10 years has become a, like a buzzword, a very like, uh, it's a very cool thing to do. But at the same time, we were finding that uh, um, being called activists was problematic in itself, and that actually we want to use the tools, the methods, and the background that we have in our professions um, to actually engage with ongoing struggles, be they uh, housing struggles, be they uh, struggles over the garbage crisis, be they struggles over the privatization of the of the seafront. So all of these issues have been emerging in Lebanon for the past 10 years, and public works is, I wouldn't say a reaction to them, but actually sits in this context. It positions itself in this context, but um, tries to institutionalize the work that we do based on a reaction to knowledge production that's confined in foreign language institutions. Um, but also um, the issue of growing up, also the what form the institution took was also a big question for us. So on one level we, on one level we didn't want to be registered as an NGO because we do not work in an NGO format. At the same time, we didn't want to be registered as pure company because commissioned work is not the only thing we do. Uh, looking at a lot of legal forms, we decided to register as a civil company, which is, which is sort of a middle ground, we thought, where it's a space where we can still um, get commissioned to do things because we believe a professional practice is a very honest interaction with the market. So you're being paid to do things, but you're also setting the standard of what you do and what you accept to do and how you get paid to do it. But at the same time, as you said, a lot of the projects we do is projects that we conceptualize, that we won't wait for a client to come and tell us to do it, and that we believe in the importance of it happening. And then here we have to enter the, the funding uh, sphere. But we also try to, to, to address funding in the way that it doesn't put restrictions on us. We take funding from organizations that are only willing to go with the way we do things. And so, for example, one of the way we do things is that most of the projects, like the 10 projects we're working on now and that we're juggling, 
we produce everything in Arabic. And this has, been a, has caused a lot of limitations for us. But it's something that we commit to. So no matter what happens, the research is published in Arabic. We produce publications under a Creative Commons license in Arabic. Um, and this has been something that we, like, we're not willing to, to retreat from. So it's sort of uh, put limit limitations on our resources, but at the same time, it's growing in different ways because a new generation of architects, urbanists, and designers are also attracted to this sort of uh, work environment. So we've grown over the past five years from being two people to now being 10 people. Uh, but again, that comes with a lot of challenges. Yes, um, and maybe like that's something that I'm going to turn to Ipar and um, the idea of when you were talking, I was just thinking, of course, I know your practice uh, better because w we've worked together and, uh, and you're practicing in Istanbul, but um, just something that you said at the end where you said, of course, the last one, uh, last, uh, exhibition that we did is not so akin to what we've been doing before, but I think that comes with, we were talking earlier with Sally, like the um, organisms, um, an organization is like an organism, it just grows and it goes down, it has to lay low sometimes, it has to change form and everything, so I think that's a cycle that you're taking on as well. And uh, within that, I think one of the, I mean, this is your stated purpose, one of the things that you say is that you're working with it, your younger uh, generation, your peers, but also you're working with um, spaces that you find and actively looking for spaces and starting the exhibition building from there, there which I find very interesting and a big contrast to something like Lugare Dudas, where, which is founded on an on a house, specific house. The house came first, the building came first. So for example, I mean, this is a very hypothetical question, but uh, to sort of carry on from that, like what if you had a space? What if you were offered a space? Or w would you ever, like um, this relationship between the space and yourself, how, how do you see that? Would you allow it to change? Would you let it go? Or just this, to take off from this idea of changing your practice. What are your givens? What are your, no, yeah, of course, changeables? yeah, it's, but it will be something really different than we, we have been doing. And, but uh, we were, we were dreaming about having a space and we were talking about it, but probably even if we had a space, uh, we will continue to do uh, exhibitions outside this space. It will be like more, more like public programs or workshops or residency for artists. Um, so far, we actually take profit from the conditions, uh, logistic conditions and uh, material conditions, and it was what uh, what we. It is our way, actually. Um, also, in the practice of using in the buildings, we we simply put the uh, artworks by using the possibilities of the uh, building by using physical physical materials of the building instead of um, installing and in design uh, produced for these exhibitions. Um, so yeah, we are going with uh, conditions, yeah. I guess, and, um, and I think like um, maybe Sharmini, and this is like, maybe you can take it up, I'd probably if you find it applies to you, you've been commissioning a lot of works, and I think that's one of the reasons maybe you did, uh, you did choose to work with this um, uh, format, uh, or at least as I understand it from our um, conversations. Maybe you could talk about the process of uh, commissioning and why um, the, the, the format, obviously you talked about why you use it, but I'm just thinking about what the relationship to um, working with artists are, and uh, if you would ever like decide to work with, you know, like um, to dissemin uh, to do like scholarly search or something like this, the the relationship to the artists in Sri Lanka and how you want to show them abroad. Um, <coughs> so the, uh, if I understand, the question is about uh, how to com the commissioning of 
of the, the projects and Um, well, I think maybe one thing importantly to say about raking leaves too is that it's um, um, it's very small the um, the organization and the output um, and and it will never change it will never become bigger um, and I feel sometimes there's often this um, sort of way of thinking of organizations and practice um, and programs that they would become bigger, um, more diversified, um, they reach more people. Um, and I think that's really what I'm not interested in um, doing at all. And that's not just because I don't want to think, uh, to overpublish, um, or that, um, you know, that these things are that important that they have to be multiplied. Um, so in the commissioning itself, it's very hard because it's choosing often uh, to work with a person or a number of artists um, out of um, on a project which might take two, three years. So it's not as if it's one week or two week or two, you know, it's not these short kind of turnovers. So choosing an artist is really tough because it's the commitment of them as well. And I think with many artists, that's not often the case that they can commit in that, in that way. So that's one of the problems um, that happens. And sometimes the conversation with an artist might begin maybe four or five years ago. And it um, will take that amount of time before something actually fr comes into fruition as a conversation to lead to an actual artist book. Um, the commissioning process itself as well is, I mean, not so different to commissioning um, many other kinds of art forms. Um, only that with an artist book, um, it's very rare to work with an artist where they understand the, <coughs> the architecture of the book. Mm, even to understand how a book, even understanding printing, how a book is printed. Um, and actually, I'm not even from this background myself. Um, I've learned it all. And and this is what's so amazing is to work with these artists, every single one, where they are being initiated into just a very new way of working and, and how they, like with Aisha Khalid, her two-sided exercise book, she knew what she wanted to do right from the beginning. And she said, and of course, there will be this dog ear shamani. And I was like, of course, like, <laughs> you know, this is like made by accident. <laughs> but, you know, we had to um, value engineer that into the entire process. Of course, all those mistakes were intentional printer's errors. Um, but even, um, you know, there's this kinds of wonderful relationships um, which are about uh, working with that artist, but they come about through this process of making. And I guess, you know, the curatorial background that I have is w was, uh, you know, geared towards exhibition making. But I think sometimes more and more exhibition is less about, exhibition practice is not so much about a making, it's about organizing, exhibition organizing. And I'm not too great at organizing, but the making is that aspect of the book production and the commissioning that is so key and, and it's, me, I'm the only person in the organization, but we it's working with artists, designers, and, and the printers, so. Shaking your head, Sally. <laughs> with the organizing, you're shaking your head. <laughs> yes, most of the time, the exhibition making is about <laughs> organizing. I think we can all agree to that. Um, I think uh, we can open it up to conversations, if um, to questions, if anyone has them from the floor as well, um, just in general, um, and to one another. And Hello, um, I have a question for Abir. Uh, it seems to me that you're undertaking a very brave exercise. Have you received threats from property developers? Yes. Do you feel, have you received threats from property developers? It seems to me that you are 
challenging very powerful interests in your city. D was that inaudible? Yeah, maybe you want to think about that for a second, but yeah, I think the question is whether, like, uh, what the response is from the city, and mostly from a more official point of view, and uh, and not from the uh, the public. Um, yeah. 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 No. No. Go ahead. Um, okay. It's. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that we ever, that we've ever been threatened, but the bigger challenge is to actually create some crack in the wall, because as much as the Lebanese context is one of where you can voice a lot of things without necessarily being threatened, or but it's very difficult that these voices actually. Uh, create a crack in the wall. So um, I would say that it's not as much a question of threat, but it's a question of the multiple challenges. And the multiple challenges are not purely uh, challenges in terms of uh, how we work or how we organize, but to actually create a niche in the, in the discourse or in the public opinion that's able to get somewhere. And this is why and some of these challenges, for example, we see them when we do neighborhood meetings. Um, and so when the neighborhood meeting is about housing and there's 50 of the, of the neighborhood residents, um, and so you're, you're all on the same page that you have a concern about your housing condition, but then the moment the question goes further and tackles a lot of a set of other political questions such as what is exclusive private property or or your vision of inclusion or your view of the migrant workers living in the neighborhood and then you start to uh, or for example one when a local uh, real estate developer comes to the meeting you start to be faced with a lot of deeper conceptual and political questions and and that these indirectly start threatening your initial motivation per se uh, housing for example because a lot of times it's as much as we're uh, fighting the state we're also trying to build a, like this is a very like uh, big thing to say but we're actually trying to rebuild society really because I think for the past 20 years, we've retreated. Uh, and I think what we're trying to do now is to actually engage again with all the venues that we've retreated from and that political parties had not retreated from. So we're trying to like stitch work that's been lacking for the past 20 years. I don't know if I actually answered your question, but yeah, and in, in summary, it's not a direct threat. It's just a more very complex uh, layers of uh, what faces us. Uh, yes, I, I have a question to you too. In which aspects could you say your, your work is successful? <laughs> well. No, not not at, not in the whole, but in particular projects. Yes, it's a very difficult question, but maybe maybe I'll, it's fine. But I'll, I think I'll try to answer it, uh, not purely through the the work of our collective of public works. Um, I'd like to ca answer it from another angle because it very much uh, says something about ways of working and how these ways of working influence ways of thinking. Um, in the 2011 protests that happened in Beirut uh, in reaction to the, to the garbage crisis, um, I think a very main battle was uh, gaining public opinion. Um, before the 2011 protest, we as individuals, I was engaged in a campaign 
um, to preserve one of the seafront sites in Beirut, which is called the Delie, which is in Raushe, if anyone knows Beirut. So this campaign had been, um, why was I saying 2011? It's 2015, I'm sorry. So this campaign had been ongoing from 2013 to 2015. And the campaign, um, as someone who was part of the campaign, it was working very much in the way, uh, in, in the approach that we do in public works, which is about pro producing research-based knowledge and disseminating this knowledge through alternative means, either by media outlets, the digital formats, but all, um, not, in the, not in the form of like giving information, but actually engaging in debate. So when the 2015 uh, protests against the garbage crisis happened, one activist group within the, within the protest decided to go and do a direct intervention on, on the site by removing the, the fence that was uh, built around the site to ban the public from entering. Um, not a single citizen criticized this act, which was very easily could have been criticized as a violation of private property, as an act of violence, and all these words were actually used to discredit the 2015 protests. And I always like to tell this story because I want to point to the importance of building a public opinion before actually uh, engaging in confrontation. And this, this, is this is a very important trajectory because once you gain public opinion, you have like the strongest uh, ally for your cause against the state. And I think it's along these lines that we work a lot in public works. So I wouldn't say now there's a, there's a final success story, but there's a trajectory of work that's really b trying to build alliances uh, with community members, with media, with a general public opinion to be able to reach a success story. Hi, uh, I have a question for Sharmini. It's actually a question and a half. Um, I'm curious uh, whom you consider as readers and audience, and if uh, you extend, if um, you prefer to also extend the dialogue beyond <laughs> the framework of the book, because um, of course um, the book format is a wonderful format, and but you know distribution, even if you might have really good distributors. Um, you know, people's access to those spaces might be limited, but maybe this is the intimacy that you wanna, you know, maintain. I'm just purely curious. Well, the distribution of them is, um, you know, many people who print um, <coughs> uh, uh, books um, don't have, don't put the thought and the time and investment into distribution. And I think if you want to publish, you must do that as uh, um, it's imperative because the way that you know bookshops, the outlets that a public come into contact with a book is is such that it's a business model where each of those booksellers do not want to have one thousand relationships with publishers. So they y you're actually bound by a certain business model that is there that means you as a publisher have one relationship with certain a handful of distributors, and the distributors have the multiple relationships with booksellers. Um, and this is very technical, but actually to understand that is to then to, to, to strategize around then, you want to make sure that your books are getting into the hands of, uh, or being accessible, so they need to go through this network. And I think people who don't really understand that are going to end up sitting with boxes of books somewhere, and they'll no, never go anywhere. So it's taken a long time to get where I have with, with those distributor relationships, because one thing I was being pushed to do a lot was the distributor takes 70% of the value of the book. So if I sell a book for $35, they're taking literally $26. 
So do the math. There's, you know, it's like ten dollars I get back in 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 the pocket of the organization, and it doesn't. It costs, let's say, eleven dollar a copy. So I'm out a dollar per book project if 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 we're not, you know, really hitting kind of margins. And I'm I'm just saying that because you know the distribution is really. Um, your 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 hands are tied because you 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 can't do it without the without the bookseller um, the dis book distributors. If I was to imagine, then you ask me whether um, you know who these are for. I mean, it, I've never, you know, I've never idealized that these are for this mass audience. I mean, it's just pointless. It's for a very specific crowd of people who are a book buying art buying public and and that is why the distributor you know they 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 only supply to, to and this is it annoys me but they do only supply to um, independent booksellers and, and museum shops and, and if I try and ask them why don't you try and get into the high street booksellers nah no point it's not enough and you know that it, it, I'm in the hands of of their business to business relationships. So when I get a chance to actually you know have a relationship with the cons the person who I see, is in two occasions when we have a book launch and we do these activities. You have direct relationship with people buying the books, and and Raking Neves does make um, uh, you know these into events, conversations with the artists, etc. Equally, um, there's there's something that's really been helping a huge amount is the artist book fairs. So these artist book fairs are these great events where um, if you can get in, um, you you get a chance to meet with people who are not the general public, <laughs> still the art world, but they will buy the books and they will have this you know one-on-one -on -one relationship but you also have days where the professional days where people come around who are the curators from book collections around the world um, many museums collect books um, so recently like the Getty bought um, a whole set of special editions of Raking Leaves so it's very nice to be able to go into collections such as that and when I say that I mean that the collection obviously means um, that you know that work will be seen by many more people at at some point one one hopes it sits in a collection it's a bit like a library book it sits in a library and you know it's very interesting when you have these old style library stickers where the date tells you when someone took that book out and if you were to analyze all the dates you could look at who's read that book at certain times but you don't know who it was but nevertheless it was one book read by however many people I think we're almost out of time. You had a question. If you're up. Okay. I think we'll take that question and we'll. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question for you uh, that I understand completely this idea of language and politics and politics of language. The way when you said uh, you don't publish anything, anything in English. So my question, I'm just wondering uh, that situation uh, in the Indian context where we have like thousands of languages, 15 official languages, and at that moment, how do you suggest when you choose one particular language, then somehow by public, uh, publishing, suppose I will write in some language like Hindi or Sanskrit, which was claimed as Indian language. Uh, so in some way, I will feed the national propaganda. You know, like uh, now the government we have, they are like putting, uh, they are trying to build one national language, one culture, one monolithic idea of the society. So I'm wondering that, don't you feel that to have a strong ideology that I will only publish in this language, that will feed that national propaganda ideology? That's the. <laughs> Is that an invitation for public works India? <laughs> um. I, I think it's <coughs> this is a great question, and I think it opens up a lot of the debates we have around language, and language not necessarily um, what is written language, but also what is the visual language, what is the what is the way we're trying to say things. Um, I totally agree that it 
when I'm speaking about pro publishing in Arabic, it's not necessarily um, suppressing all other forms of, uh, of expression that might come out. But this is very part, this is very, I think, particular to the Lebanese context where um, it's sort of a become a default that everybody understands English and then it's okay to do a lot of our professional work in English and it's okay not to publish in Arabic because everybody reads English. And this is a sort of a, it's not very accurate because the moment you get out of a very confined circle within the capital city, uh, no. Arabic is the language that every community understands. And this is why basically newspapers and politicians still speak in Arabic, because this is the language of their audience, of the wider audience. And so, and we want to engage with this audience. And this is why, what I mean when I say we publish locally in Arabic, that we're not going to, to disregard 90% uh, of the population. But this brings me to another question that you're opening up, which is we could still be publishing in Arabic and it could still be a very, in a very dogmatic manner and a very uh, top-down manner. And this is something we're also very much trying to work on. So how do you th say things in a, without depoliticizing them, without watering them down, but uh, also it's not a, an oppressive language. It's not, you're not saying it in an oppressive way. So it's always a, we, we always workshop on how to do these things. And it's always a trial of trying to, to say things in an accessible way, yet still in the way that you want to say things. And with that, thank you um, for everyone. And thank you.